and I'm going to say hello everyone and thank you for being here today again. Um, we have a new edition of the Sets on Live webinar. My name is Mariano Ramirez and I'm going to moderate today's talk. But before we get started and we normally remind you, please let's thank our sponsorship from International Association of Sedimentologists, which allow us to offer all these resources free of charge. So please uh, remember to visit our webpage and see all the resources that we have available for you. Today's lecture is uh, by Liz Mahon from Wilkes University, for, sorry, from the Wilkes Center at U University of Utah. Liz received her bachelor degree from Queensland University in Australia and her PhD from the University of Melbourne. Her current research focuses on coastal geomorphology and sedimentology on both modern and ancient environments. But today she's going to talk us about exploring coastal petland systems different case of study from the Lake Cretaceous and Paleocene. So Liz, the stage is completely yours. Thank you. <laughs> um, lovely. So yeah, today I'm going to be sharing some work I've been doing um, on coastal peatland systems and then sharing kind of two case studies um, from some of my present research. So I thought I'd kind of cover a bit about general coal geology from specifically from the depositional perspective of the coals first um, before we move into those case studies. So I guess the, the really big question is um, why coal? <laughs> What's the point, you know? Um, we know it's a, a super useful energy source. Um, we, you know, it's been used for energy since, you know, caveman days. Um, but is there is there really anything more to it than that? Um, well, I think so. <laughs> so coals are a really beautiful example of a biogenic sedimentary structure, a sedimentary rock. So they're composed almost entirely of plant material. And because of that, they tend to have a really unique chemistry uh, and they're capable of recording things like the chemical makeup of the plants that grew, that went into making the coal. Um, they're, they're not just black mush, um, they actually record a lot of information, a lot of really useful information. Uh, so they're really excellent record keepers of plant evolution, particularly, um, and things like climate change and uh, et cetera. So they're capable of recording all of these different types of information um, that are specific to them as coals to, to this biogenic sedimentary rock, but also the same things that you would get with other sedimentary rocks like relative sea level change or tectonics. Um, by basically by their morphology and their relationship to other sedimentary rocks and facies. So they're a really fascinating and unusual sedimentary rock. So kind of at a, when you think about it in the, at its most simplest, uh, coals can form in environments with water and vegetation. So really you need, there's more to it than that, but those are kind of the two key building blocks um, to make coal. So obviously those two things are, are pretty common on Earth. So the actual depositional environment of coal can vary quite a bit. And historically, uh, coal was predominantly to be interpreted to, to form in fluvial settings. That was kind of the most common um, depositional setting for, for coal formation. And it was thought that coals, if they were low in sulfur, that must mean they are freshwater, therefore they are fluvial. And this um, kind of interpretation of a fluvial um, as the dominant setting for coal formation still, still persists today. So there's been quite a bit of work on depositional environment of coals kind of over the years. And our, our understanding has evolved a little bit, but there seems to be this persistence of the, the classic fluvial coal setting. Um, you know, we see it in textbooks and things with your, your kind of classic diagrams and whatnot. However, when we look at modern examples of those settings, um, they tend to show a different- Sorry, Liz. Yes. Sorry for interrupting you. Sure. Um, but there is like a black, a gray re rectangle on the right side of the screen. Do you have it? Ah, there you go. Now it is- Is that better? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're right. Moving things around. <laughs> um, let me try it. There we go. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, when we look at modern uh, settings, modern peat forming settings, these classic fluvial um, type types of environments, the peats that we see forming there tend to be 
um, tend to be a bit thin. Uh, they tend to have a bit of siliciclastic material in them, and they probably will only form coals of at best a couple of metres. However, we have coals in the rock record that, uh, you know, 20 metres, or, or in the case of the Gibson Basin, 100 metres is a, a single seam thickness. So we need to think about how these super thick coals are forming from a depositional perspective. Now, this isn't the focus of this talk, but I do think it's important to at least acknowledge uh, that the plant communities that have contributed to coals have changed through geologic time pretty significantly. Uh, you know, from your classic carboniferous forests, uh, the Mesozoic, and then into more um, uh, vegetation that we see that's a bit more similar to today. So the plant, plant type has varied quite a bit through geologic time. But despite those evolutionary changes, those different plants are essentially occupying the same niches. So while the plant itself may change, uh, its kind of broad role in coal accumulation is generally the same. And so if anyone's ever kind of delved into peatland and coal geology, um, they'll know that there's quite a bit of terminology. <laughs> um, and you know, a lot of the terms, some of them are perhaps not clearly defined and sometimes they're kind of applied a bit inconsistently. So I'm not gonna, not gonna use too much terminology here other than to just highlight these ones, particularly ombrogenous peatlands. So ombrogenous peatlands are those that receive their moisture predominantly from precipitation. And because of that, they're able to build up above the water table, um, which is quite unusual. So we call these domed peats. And that's as opposed to topogenous peats, uh, which receive their moisture from groundwater. So these are your low-lying marshes. And that's probably what you know people tend to think of when they think of coal forming environment. So there's um, a zillion other ways to define and divide up peat types, but we're going to kind of run with those main those main ones today. We can also look at peatlands from their climatic settings. So modern ombrogenous peatlands can form in cool temperate to boreal climate zones. Uh, and these cool temperate peats, they tend to be composed pretty much predominantly of sphagnum moss. Um, but we also see things like sedges and shrubs and things. And they tend to have a fairly slow rate of accumulation, you know, maybe a millimeter a year. And that cold, those cold temperatures, um, they contribute to the preservation of that plant material. So they also contribute to a slower growth rate of the plant material, but they uh, inhibit breakdown from bacteria and fungal activity as well. And then kind of at the other end of the spectrum, we have these tropical peatlands. So these are quite different to cool temperate peatlands, uh, and primarily because they are forested. So they're basically a jungle. Um, that if you look at them, that, that's kind of what you'd see, just really dense forest. And you, if you think of the tropics, you think of really humid, warm conditions, really lush, optimal plant growing conditions. So obviously the plants that are growing here are growing quite quickly. Um, so we have a faster rate of accumulation for these peat domes. In addition to that faster growth rate, um, the type of plant matter that's going into the accumulation of this peat is different. So they're forested, therefore we're going to have a lot of wood going into the makeup of that peat. And wood is uh, wood breaks down slower than you know mosses and, and ferns and things. So we have the combined effect of faster growth rate of plant material and a slower breakdown. And it, you know it was um, kind of historically it was thought that you couldn't accumulate peat at the tropics, um, that it couldn't be possible with that warm, humid kind of climate, you have lots of fungal activity and bacteria and the peat will oxidize and um, that sort of thing. However, there's been heaps of particularly new research done in Borneo and Malaysia. Um, and we now know that there's beautiful, big tropical peatlands um, also in the Amazon and in the Congo. Um, so we see these lovely thick tropical peats forming. And there's been um, a bit of research into why, how, how are the peats forming in these tropical settings and, and people are starting to look into the chemistry of that plant material that perhaps tropical plants have a higher aromatic content that may inhibit the breakdown 
um, and that sort of thing. So these ombrogenous peatlands can form in a range of climatic settings, and they can also um, form from highlands all the way down to coastal plain. So we're going to look at, at coastal plain settings now. So we have we have our, our low-lying peats, um, our topogenous peats, and then we have our domed ombrogenous peats. So low-lying coastal peatlands uh, tend to be prone to marine inundation. Um, you imagine storm surges, king tides, you know, any, any of those peatlands that are forming close to that marine setting um, will experience influence from marine water and sediment influx. So the result is they tend to make peats that are are high in sulfur from that marine water and high in inorganic components. However, if you have ombrogenous domed peats um, at close to your, your marine setting, um, these peats, because they're domed, they're able to build up and elevate themselves. So by their own kind of positive topography, they're protected from that marine inundation and from that sediment influx. So these Domed peats in a, in a lower coastal plain setting can often make um, quite clean, low sulfur, low ash coals. So how, how do we know, how do you know when you look at a coal that it formed as a domed peat or a low lying peat? How, how could you tell? There are a couple of kind of key criteria um, that I've got here. So this is just a couple, definitely not exhaustive. Um, so one of the things that you may see is lithotype cycles. Um, so this is a really beautiful example from a, a Corosidus et al paper, where we see this really nice um, cycles of color change within the peat. Um, so this lithotype cycle is interpreted to uh, be expressing possibly a drying of the peat as it domes, but actually it's it's probably a bit more complicated than that. We're seeing um, changes in acidity and nutrients as well as that peat kind of domes. And when we look at the palynology of these lithotype cycles, there's a really nice correlation. So these darker um, basal colors uh, correlate or they, they have a lot of um, spore pollen of um, like emergent marsh and very wet tolerant vegetation. And then as you move up through your um, coal, you move through this floral zonation. So you see different vegetation types as that peat dome evolves and, and builds up. And then the other kind of important aspect for these, peat, these umbrogenous peatlands is if you have really thick coals that are very low in sulfur and inorganic components, and you know from their depositional context that they're forming in close proximity to a marine setting, then there's a high probability that those were ombrogenous peatlands. And then the other question is why, like, why do peats dome? What, what, what is happening? <laughs> why do they do that? <laughs> um, and kind of in a simple way, it's when vegetation accumulation rate is higher than the degradation. So we need quite a high rainfall for ombrogenous peatlands. It has to be high enough to counteract the reducing impact of the groundwater as the peat builds or to elevate the water table within the peat dome. Um, and, you know, I've talked about these ombrogenous peat domes and low-lying topogenous peats, but they're not, they don't occur in isolation. They often occur together. So you may have a peatland that starts off as a, a low-lying topogenous peat and then through time and enough rainfall and the right settings, right conditions, your peat will start to build up and, and you'll eventually evolve into an abrogenous peat. Similarly, you may have a, a lateral, laterally to these abrogenous peats, you may have topogenous peats. Um, so these kind of, they're end members but they also occur, they don't occur in isolation, they're occurring together, they're intimately related. Um, and, you know, so modern forested peat domes, um, they generally just appear as densely forested areas. So you don't actually tend to see like a nice little, a little dome. Um, you, you just see forest. And this is um, not pretty, but it's a nice example. In Indonesia, this is a drainage channel. They've cut through the peat dome and you can see the peat 
in that drainage channel. So if they hadn't done that, you know, you would just see trees, you know. Um, so these peat domes, they can build up to, I think, around nine, around nine meters elevation. So they can be quite tall. Um, and a lot of the really thick coals that we see in the rock record, they often have wood preserved in them. So here's a nice example from onshore Gippsland Basin, where you often see, you know, whole tree trunks preserved. And that's similar to what we see in modern peat domes. Um, there's, you know, researchers have tried to take core augers and things through these peat domes and the tool get hits a tree trunk. Um, they can't go any further. Uh, so we know that wood is a big component um, of modern modern tropical peats and then also ancient ones. Uh, however, those cool temperate peats that I, I mentioned earlier that are very sphagnum moss dominant are often used as analogues for ancient coals, but we kind of they, they're kind of quite different. So perhaps they're not maybe not the best analog. And then of course if we're talking about uh, coastal plain peatlands, we have to think about sea level. Um, so there's some research that suggests that the thickest peralic coals are often associated with a transition um, from transgression to regression or vice versa. Um, so basically what kind of what happens with the, the onset of a transgression, landward clastics will have a bit of a reduced influence seaward as that sea level is rising. And there's an increase in accommodation space with that sea level rise. Now the, you know, these peats are fresh water, um, but because they're so close to the marine setting, the kind of um, base level for the freshwater and the, the seawater is about the same. Um, but these domed peats, ombrogenous peats, are protected from that saline and said influx by their positive topography. So they're able to maintain kind of their, their happy peaty place um, despite rising sea level. Um, and, you know, eventually they will become overtopped um, and flooded. And then we see things like um, marine sediments deposited on top of the coal. Um, but the key point is these transgressive coals, uh, transgressions are, are not always destructive. You can preserve quite a bit, um, uh, quite a bit of sediment um, that's not destroyed with the transgression. So we've talked about why coal. Um, now, why why coastal peatlands? <laughs> um, well, I think they're really cool. <laughs> they're, they're sort of a little snapshot into a part of Earth history. Uh, and we can get heaps of information from them, you know, climate, plant evolution, paleogeography. Um, they're also, both modern ancient ones are hotspots for biodiversity. So if you think of these systems, there's a huge uh, amount of flora and fauna that are inhabiting these ecosystems um, and being essentially recorded in these coals. They also record paleoclimate. Uh, you know, modern peatlands, we have a record since the last glacial maximum. Uh, and then in the back in Earth's history, um, you know, we have ancient paleoclimate recorded. Um, we can look at things like the types of plants that were growing, the leaf types, the model density, um, etc. And then perhaps one of the most important is that kind of broadly, coastal wetlands are responsible for one of the largest volumes of carbon storage per area of any environment on our planet, uh, which is pretty crazy. So <laughs> um, these, are, these are incredibly important, especially in these days of changing climate and climate awareness, they're incredibly important carbon sinks. And you know, they are kind of experiencing degradation with clearing and, and urbanization and farming, et cetera. So this is a, a palm oil plantation on a peat dome. So these coastal environments are susceptible um, to change and we can look at the rock record and look at how they've responded to changes and use that information and kind of apply it to a modern, um, modern setting. So that's kind of um, some background information. Um, I've covered a bit of the, the why question. <laughs> um, so now we're gonna look at two case studies, uh, one from the late Cretaceous in the US and one from the Paleocene in Australia. 
So we'll, we'll start with the US, the late Cretaceous in the US. Um, I'm going to caveat this by saying it's very preliminary. <laughs> um, I've just started working on this. So um, during the late Cretaceous, the Kuiperowitz Plateau was located at about 41 degrees north um, in the Northern Hemisphere. And I have a little map of the US up here. So the Kuiperowitz Plateau is located in Utah in the south central portion of the state. Um, so it's located in the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Uh, it has this Capitol Reef National Parks to the east, Bryce Canyon National Parks to the west. So a really beautiful area, really lovely part of Utah. We have the Escalante River um, kind of cutting down on that eastern side uh, and Lake Powell to the south. And then during the late Cretaceous, the US was kind of bisected by the Western Interior Seaway. So the Kuiperowitz Plateau is located on the western shoreline of that seaway. Uh, and it's only slightly been affected by tectonics since then. Um, you know, just a little bit of gentle folding. So it's a really beautifully preserved shoreline in outcrop. So this is just a Google Earth image. Um, I've rotated it, so north is to the right. Uh, and this is up the eastern side of the plateau. Um, and you can see just on Google Earth how lovely those cliffs are. So this is the straight cliffs. Uh, and the plateau is approximately 3,000 metres elevation above sea level. And that plateau outcrop contains a predominantly Cretaceous stratigraphic sequence. So we're going to look at the Strait Cliffs formation, specifically the John Henry member. The John Henry member contains some of the thickest coals in the area, um, up to you know nine or ten meters thick uh, individual coals. And there's been quite a bit of previous study on the clastics of the John Henry member. Um, there's been research on the shoreline shoreline type and behavior through time, on fluvial systems, on sediment source. Uh, and there has been some work done on the coals, particularly from an economic perspective, understandably. Um, but there's not been much done recently on the depositional setting of these coals and how it relates to other parts of the coastal plain. Um, so there was some good work done on that kind of back in the day, um, but not a lot's been done in more recent days. So because of those coals, obviously, there's going to be interest uh, from industry and government. Uh, and there's been quite a few wells drilled on the Kuiperowitz Plateau. Uh, notable is a subset of 32 wells that were drilled in the early 70s by the Utah Power and Light Company. Um, so the, the kind of goal of this drilling campaign was to measure and document the John Henry member coals and try and understand them a bit. Um, and basically all 32 of those wells took core. So there's a, a whole stack of well logs and core um, available, which is really handy for us. So the John Henry member is composed of these lovely stacked shore face sandstones. Um, this is a, a nice image from Julia Mulholland's thesis. And we see these lovely um, kind of coarsening up sandstones here. And she found that these sandstones, um, they've been interpreted as barriers, barrier shorelines. Um, with varying degrees of kind of tide and wave influence through time. Um, so here's an example of uh, our well log and core through the John Henry member. Um, so there's you know quite a few through those barrier and back barrier successions and kind of unsurprisingly they show interbedded coal, sandstone and siltstone, kind of what you'd expect. The, so the, I mentioned the John Henry member is quite coal rich. The coal tends to form these four coal zones. Uh, the lowermost, the older one, the coals are not great, you know, at best maybe two meters. Um, but then above that, we have the Christensen coal zone. So these coals are up to nine or 10 meters thick and exceptionally, exceptionally low sulfur and ash. And then overlying that, we have the Rees and the Alvey coal zone. So these are each six meters and relatively low sulfur and ash. 
there hasn't actually been as much published on the palynology of the coals uh, in the John Henry member than that I expected. Um, so the few kind of published studies that I've come across, uh, they indicate the vegetation consisted of lots of gymnosperms, um, some angiosperms, ferns, mosses, palms, the sort of um, vegetation that likes a wet tropical type environment. Um, we also see evidence of proximity to a marine environment. Um, so the thinner coals are intercalated or transition laterally into shelly carbonaceous mudstones. So we see these transitional fasces as well. And then there's also um, a glutinate foraminifera reported from the interseam sediments, which are common in brackish settings. During the 19, around the 1990s, um, the USGS conducted a study on the John Henry member coals, and they generated a whole series of thickness maps uh, of those coals. So this is, a, this is an isopleth map. Um, that was a word I hadn't come across before. <laughs> um, so it's showing the number of coals more than six metres. So I think they get up to four um, coals through there that are more than six metres in the one location. Um, so I've plotted this map with the location of the shoreline. So this is for the whole John Henry member. Um, and you'll notice that those coals, those the thickest coals and the most coals are occurring right behind that paleo shoreline location. So these these coals, you know, they are they are intimately associated with these coastal fasces. So to kind of sum it up. Um, we have these low sulfur and low ash coals that are up to like nine or 10 meters thick, but they're forming really close to a marine setting. Um, and our, our palynology indicates that they were vegetated with trees, gymnosperms, angiosperms, really tropical vegetation. So we're thinking um, that these are probably classic kind of tropical forested umbrogenous peat domes. Okay, so now we're going to rotate um, down to the southern hemisphere and look at our second case study, which is the Gippsland Basin. So during the Paleocene, the Gippsland Basin was located at 60 degrees south. And the Gippsland Basin is known for its incre incredibly thick coals. Um, you know, onshore, there are individual coal seams of 100 metres and they're stacked up to 300 metres of continuous kind of brown coal in that onshore area. So obviously that coal is mined. <laughs> and then offshore, the, uh, the Gippsland Basin has a lot of hydrocarbons. So there's oil and gas offshore as well. So a very energy rich basin. Um, so with that kind of energy richness comes a lot of attention from industry. Uh, so we have those open cut coal mines onshore and then offshore, we have our hydrocarbon fields with lots of well data. Um, so, you know, most of the research on these coals is focused in the onshore area. Um, you know, there's beautiful exposures of those coals, um, which makes them easy to study. But there's been less research done on the offshore coals. Uh, so there's quite a bit of data that we can use to look at the offshore coals. There's plenty of well data. Um, and there's also this mer big merged 3D seismic volume. The Gippsland Basin has a really classic kind of rift basin stratigraphy. Um, we're going to focus in on the Latrobe group. So the Latrobe group is composed of stacked coastal plain, shore face and marine uh, deposits. And these um, shoreline, shoreline deposits these backstep pretty continuously right up to the Oligocene um, when the basin went into a, a, a basin inversion phase. But a really common and pervasive feature throughout all of these coastal plain deposits from the late Cretaceous to the Miocene is the presence of thick coals, really thick coals all throughout here. So those onshore coal seams of, you know, individ individual seams of up to 100 metres, those are forming in the um, Oliga Miocene interval. But offshore, we have coals, um, black coals, up to 30 metres thick. Um, so, so an incredibly coal-rich basin. 
So we're going to, we're kind of focus on the lower interval today on the Paleocene. Um, so this is a, a seismic line. Um, I have uninterpreted at the top and interpreted at the bottom. Um, so there's, there's a, it's actually four units through here. A late Cretaceous unit has snuck in, but we're going to focus on the upper three in the Paleocene. So these three depositional units show quite nice progradation at that shore face. Um, you know, they the T8 here, the lower one, progrades for up to 14 kilometers. Um, and so, so despite each of these units being progradational, they collectively backstep um, with subsidence of the basin. Also, each of these coastal units is probably on average 200 meters thick. Um, so these are amalgamated, you know, they're, they're not little individual shore face deposits. They're, they're quite significant um, deposits and they're incredibly sandy as well. Oh, I should also mention the seismic is, is minimum phase and SEG reverse polarity. So for this study, we used um, an electrolith FSE scheme. So um, we used chameleon software, um, which you can get from the Kansas Geologic Survey. And it's actually really handy software. So what it does is uh, it combines your wireline logs uh, and applies a color cube to them um, and then spits out this uh, lithology um, log, colorful lithology log. So the reason this um, methodology is so useful is because it highlights really subtle changes in lithology that you probably wouldn't be able to see if you were just looking at your individual wireline logs. And it's also really useful for the Gippsland Basin where we have a really comprehensive wireline log suites because of all that oil and gas focus. Um, so when we looked at the, the electrolithophases for, for these wells, we see, um, so the well Helios one here is showing kind of your classic marine sedimentation. So interbedded mudstones and siltstones. Um, if then we look at Roundhead one, and um, this is right on the on the the shoreline through the prograde, and this is showing a really nice, really sandy interval at that shore face. And then as we step landward, um, we move into that kind of lower coastal plain coal forming environment where we see these bright red and pink coals interbedded with those uh, sandstones and siltstones. And these lithophases correlate really nicely to the coal. Um, fortunately. <laughs> so uh, sandstones, we see sort of a range of grain sizes. Um, that yellow staining there is hydrocarbons. Um, our siltstones, you know, have classic uh, heterolithic sedimentary structures, biotubation, um, and then of course our coal and mudstone. And there's also been a fair bit done on the palynology of these coals. So, um, you know, when when you're trying to put together comprehensive stratigraphic um, framework using seismic, um, industry likes to have a pretty high resolution palynologic framework. Um, and fortunately, um, that means we can use that data. So the palynology reveals that these coals are being formed with kind of rainforest vegetation. So things like nipa uh, and gymnostoma and plants that are really happy in warm, humid conditions. Uh, in addition, the well completion reports are reporting things like microplankton and dinoflagellates uh, in those interseam sediments, and again, agglutinate foraminifera reflecting brackish conditions, um, perhaps in little channels. So again, evidence for proximity to a marine setting. Uh, now I mentioned we have 3D seismic. So one of the really beautiful things that you can do with 3D seismic um, is run amplitude extractions. So I'm going to show you a nice extraction on the top T8 here. Um, so it's a, a negative seismic event. So I'm going to show you a maximum negative amplitude extraction. So on this extraction, we know from well logs that the gray and black correlates to sand and siliciclastics, and the white correlates to coal. Um, so we can kind of see straight away there's this nice curvilinear feature kind of coming through here. So this is our paleo shoreline. 
Um, we can even see evidence of strand lines uh, and things through there. And then, so if we if we step seaward, um, we have well logs through here indicating this is our marine, uh, our kind of condensed mudstone, siltstone interval. And if we step landward, you'll see that white coal is concentrated right behind that paleo shoreline. In fact, we have coals, you know, forming in between strand lines. It's so close to the paleo shoreline. And then as you move landward again, we move into more of an alluvial plain. So we start to lose the coals, they become a bit patchy and thin, uh, and it becomes a bit more silty, sandy dominated. So if we look at this kind of coal forming part of the amplitude extraction, I'll do a little zoom in, we can see quite a bit of detail. So we see meander scrolling evident in those channels. Um, we see meander, little meander cutoffs. Um, and the coals themselves are forming these kind of irregular ovid shapes um, throughout this interval, which is kind of cool, kind of interesting. So to kind of put that all together, uh, you know, we have these coals again forming really close to that marine setting, you know, coals forming on strand lines. Um, we have evidence of a marine influence from micropally um, and we kind of lose the coal as we go inland so that seismic extraction really nicely captures the transition from the lower coastal plain coal forming environment moving up into that upper coastal plain and, and palynology is indicating that these are tropical um, peats um, you know we have things that are that are similar to trees growing and forming these peats and also the, the form of these, the morphology of these peats is similar to modern ombrogenous peatlands. So when we're talking about analogues, um, we're thinking that maybe the Rajang Delta and Sarawak is a good, definitely a good analogue for the Gippsland Basin and possibly also for the Kaiparowitz Plateau. Um, so on this example, this is a, a satellite photo, you can see these really nice irregular ovid peat domes here. So that's really similar to what we saw in that Gippsland Basin extraction. Um, you know, these, these peats are forming in between strand lines, similar to the Gippsland Basin. Um, they're low sulfur, low ash peats, similar to the John Henry member coals. And these thick um, peats are forming on coastal settings. So they're not forming in fluvial settings. So it's again, again kind of, reinforcing that perhaps that traditional fluvial setting for coal formation is perhaps not the best analogue for what we see in the rock record. Um, so I mentioned that, that the John Henry member work is preliminary, um, so we do need to do field work, I'm just waiting for it to stop snowing and being a bit gross and cold in Utah. <laughs> um, and we want to look at how those coals are, are forming relative to the shoreline. So there's been you know, some pretty good work done on tracking those uh, shore face deposits through time. How can we link that back, those back barrier coals with those shore faces, with those regressive transgressive cycles? Um, can we see any coal facies, or evidence of lithofacies, um, floral zonation in those coals? It would be really great to kind of look into that a bit as well. And then, you know, um, Lauren Bergenheis group at Utah is doing some really great work with critical minerals in, in coal bearing strata in Utah. So, you know, maybe there's potential for that here as well. Um, who knows? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Liz, for this wonderful talk. That was very, very cool. No worries. <laughs> so now we are open to questions. Please write your question in the chat and then be sure to send it to everyone so we can read it aloud. Also, please remember to write your name and where are you watching at? Um, with that being said, I have some questions for you, please, in the sure. meantime. <laughs> so um, one of the things that I was thinking while you were talking is that, I mean, I would say that normally you relate coal to some sort of um, large accumulation of organic matter in sometimes in, in, in warmer climates. So my question is like, what's the role of the weather and especially the, 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 the war environments played here? Yeah, good question. So um, obviously climate is a big impact, 
kind of impact on these on these peats and coals. Um, but we do have coals forming in cold climates. So, and we know you don't have to have warm warm conditions to form peats and coals. Um, but you know, climate has changed quite a bit through geologic time, and it's not just a, a simple. It's not a one as you know a simple relationship between right. climate and, and peat and coal. Um, but yeah, you you can accumulate peat. Yeah, um, you know, the northern hemisphere has as many cool uh, peat forming settings. Mm -hmm. um, but but, yeah. but is the same even for like this type of coastland peatlands? I mean, it can also be related to some sort of cold environments, but in coastal environments? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think so, yeah. Um, I mean, similarly, you get peat forming in high altitude settings in closer to the equator too. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, yeah, so elevation has an impact <laughs> as well as, as um, climatic zone. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay, so in the meantime, we have some questions. So we have a question from Shim Hickey from Texas, who says, very informative talk, thanks. Is there any evidence that the Gippsland coal serve as a source rock of the offshore oil and gas accumulations? Sorry, can you say that again? <laughs> Sorry, yes. I didn't catch that. If, if, if there is any evidence that the Gippsland coal serve as a source rocks of the offshore oil and gas accumulations? Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, there has been some work done on the chemistry of the, the hydrocarbon chains um, and relating them to coals. So it is thought that deeper, much deeper coals are contributing to that hydrocarbon. Um, so the the Gippsland Basin has is, you know, is quite thick. I, I think it has like 14 kilometres of sediment in it. Um, wow. So there's, yeah, <laughs> um, so there's quite a bit of, at depth within the Gippsland Basin that we just don't image well in seismic data, um, but they're pretty sure that there's coals down there <laughs> um, and, and, you know, carbonaceous shales and things that are contributing to the, to the hydrocarbon. Yeah. Fair enough. We have another question, which is more a comment than a question from John Naud, who says, excellent talk. Your diagram from Latrop remind me of anastomosing channels. Another factor helping to form dome peat is mangrove settings. Is mangrove settings? Is that the routing prevents any channels avulsions, so peats can build up vertically? Yeah, yeah. So there's a really interesting relationship between peat doming and the channels. Um, so the channels kind of become entrenched, um, but those so the, they do those channels I showed. I didn't mention, but they do kind of anastomose in a sense, and they're they're tidal channels. Um, so they're really classic like we saw in the the analog, um, those classic tidal channels. Um, but the relationship between the peat dome and the and the channel is interesting. So yeah, the, the peat dome can prevent the channel from moving much. Um, and actually through time, and we see it in some of the seismic extractions that I didn't show in the Gibson Basin, that those channels will eventually kind of fill up um, and the peat domes will overtop the channel. They'll grow over the channel. And we get this nice sutured appearance um, when the peat domes take over, take over those little channels. Yeah. Hmm. Very cool. We are still open for questions. So guys, please don't be shy. Oh, there you go. Uh, we have another question from um, Maria Shensen from Svalbard, Norway. She says, thanks a lot for a great talk. What are your thoughts on the linkage to the shoreline position. Do you think the coal accumulation links to the sea level change or it or it is mix a mixed signal between sea level and the hydrological system pre precipitation pattern? I so I suspect it's probably a uh, depends on the setting. <laughs> um, from from what I'm seeing, we seem to see the thickest coals during the transgression, um, which is really interesting. Um, I don't know that that's that's probably not, might not be the same for everywhere, um, but yeah, there, there there is some research linking it, linking the thickest coals with with sea level with the turnaround point between the transgression regression. Um, I mean, I, I because they're so because they're forming so close to the shoreline, they're very prone to 
changes, you know, in shoreline morphology and sedimentation in relative sea level. So there's all of these factors that are going into um, the formation of these peats uh, that are external to the peat, you know. Um, so I, from the ones that I've looked at, they seem to form during a transgressive phase, um, mm. which is in, which is really interesting. Um, but I suspect in other localities, it would be more the hydrologic impact. It, it probably depends on the stability of the shoreline and those sorts of conditions. Mm. Cool. We have another question from Kate Gills from El Paso, Texas, who says, uh, thanks Liz for a great talk. Do you know what type of coals form the extensive coal measures of the Pennsylvania of Eastern US? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I've just started dipping into um, other U.S. coals, um, and I actually ca I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I'm sorry, it's nearly 4 a.m. here. <laughs> so pr pr please remember that Liz is in Australia right now, and it's 4 a.m. <laughs> sorry, yeah, I'm I'm mental blanking. I do I do actually know I was reading about them recently, but yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Very cool. So probably the Pennsylvanians are like um, different type of coals, right? Yeah, I think they're not coastal, if I'm remembering correctly. So obviously you do get coals that are not coastal, you know, um, uh, intracontinental basins can form right. coals and things. So, um, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, and do you think, Liz, that here there is uh, some sort of uh, a role for salinity here? Because those environments are probably more like type of brackish, freshwater dominated, but some time could become more sal saline environments, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So um, so that's kind of the beauty of the peat dome is that it's kind of protected um, from, from saline influx. But if your sea level starts to rise quite quickly, then your, your peat dome can't keep up. And, and suddenly that's going to be impacted quite significantly with salinity. Um, and you can actually tell that from the chemistry of the coal. You can things look at things like sulfur or boron or other marine indicators that are preserved mm. in the coal. Um, so it definitely has an impact on the plants. And then also, you know, some plants are more happy, uh, happier in brackish conditions. Some are more sensitive. Um, mm -hmm. So, and those sorts of things will vary through time as well. But yeah, um, and that's probably what's happening when your coal gets flooded. Um, you know, the plants can't handle the brackish conditions and the saltwater conditions and die. And, and, you know, once the plant dies, then the peat dome stops growing and it'll start compacting and sea level will kind of take over. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. interesting to keep thinking on that. We have another question from, well, Kate says, uh, no problem, thanks, Liz. I'm talking about the Pennsylvania call for my historical geology class. And I oh, thought cool. I'd bring a new ideas about calls that you have liked it. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and we have another question from John Nold again, who says, do you see thin coal stringers with other architecture in your calls? I see with, this with in the values in the... Ah, I, I'm going to read it again. Do you see thin coal stringers with odd architecture in your calls? I see these in the Paleocene deposits here in Alberta, and I'm not sure how they fall. Sorry, with, with odd architecture, is that what you said? Yes, cold stringers with odd, odd architecture. Um, yeah, like line yeah. forms, pleats, etc. Yeah, um, I guess, so most of the coals that I've looked at to date have been in um, core. <laughs> So <laughs> um, it's hard to get a sense of the <laughs> that stratigraphic context. Um, but yeah, given that they're forming so, so close to the, the shoreline, um, yeah, we'd, we'd expect to see them. Um, you know, we have evidence on the, the seismic extractions of them forming in between strand lines, and those strand lines correlate to clinoforms. Um, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that answered the question. <laughs> So, um, but it's common to see like clinoforms in 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 the coal formation that you have. Probably not that common, right? Um, the Gibson Basin shows clinoforms. Um, okay. The coal's not clinoformed. <laughs> the, the yeah, the the shore face sands are yeah. Um, but that's also a factor of scale too. So those um, 
glyniforms, the, those packages are like 200 meters. So that would look quite different in outcrop. Um, hmm. Whereas I think the uh, Kaparowitz outcrop isn't so clinoformy. Um, so it's obviously going to be a factor of your shoreline type as well. Um, are there barriers? Are there prograding beaches? You know, that sort of thing. Um, and then the preservation potential um, behind those kind of active clastic shore face settings. Okay, very cool. So thank you very much, Liz, for your time. No worries. Uh, thank, thank you. Very much Thanks for, for having for me. For being able today here. Uh, yeah. We we'll really enjoy the talk. Oh, we have another question. Yeah. So Darrell Long from Ontario, he says, he asks, if, do you find any evidence of early cementation at the contact between the channel sands and the dump box? Between the channel sands and the? Dome box. Oh, the the dome. Dome. Um, yeah. Not, not that I've seen. Um, early cementation. Mm, yeah, I, ca I can't think of a, I can't think of an example. Um, but you know, the, like these peat domes, they're, I guess people tend to think of peat as quite easily erodible, but they can be quite resistant to erosion. Mm. Um, you know, that vegetation is all kind of knotted and matted together. Um, so they're not, it's particularly these tropical ones. So when when we think of the the softer peat dome, quite often that's that cool temperate peat where it's all sphagnum mossy. Um, but that you know when you've got a, a whole tree trunk in your peat, <laughs> it can be pretty resistant to weathering and and channel erosion. <laughs> but yeah, I I'm, can't think of a I can't think of a cementation example. Cinnamon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. Okay, so thank you all for attending to this very interesting talk. Thank you very much, Liz, for being here today. And please all uh, keep in touch because we are sending like news soon about our next seminar. So thank you for being here today and see you next webinar. Bye.